Oh, excuse me, Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Ryswick? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. There will be no uh, president's report, this, uh, and we'll move on to the reports from the institutional heads. I would like to recognize each institutional head to report on our recent activities at each institution. We will begin with President Nook. Regent President Richards, uh, members of the board, colleagues from around the state of Iowa, members of the public, and the members of the media. Um, welcome to the University of Northern Iowa. It's always a pleasure to have you on our campus, especially on these beautiful fall mornings and, and days. It's been a, a great day and looking forward to the same today. Uh, before I begin, I want to introduce the new chief of staff to you, Oksana Grabojevic uh, uh, Hafferman. Oksana? Yeah. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on our staff. Uh, I think you'll vote on her appointment here in a little bit. But uh, Oksana's uh, joining us uh, from the College of Education. Uh, she's been a department head within the college. Uh, she's been a program leader as well. She was serving just before she came to the chief of staff position as an associate dean in the College of Education. And we really look forward to what she has to offer this university in the chief of staff role and helping us with board relations and some with our federal relations, especially around education as well. So, Oksana, again, welcome and thank you for stepping into this role for us. Today, I'll spend all of my time really talking about our request um, for uh, legislative support for the University of Northern Iowa. And we're really asking for three things. Uh, one is an increase in our general fund allocation of $8 million to be split, $4 million for tuition differentiation, and $4 million to support uh, and increase the educator, uh, educators in the state of Iowa so that we can begin to address the shortage of teachers within the state of Iowa. The uh, second request is for new special purpose funding in, at the level of $2 million to support the initiative of UNI at Iowa Community Colleges, a program that's growing uh, rapidly. And uh, we just had an, an event uh, two days ago at Indian Hills Community College launching UNI at Iowa, Hill, Indian Hills Community College. Great event. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute as well. Uh, our third request is to increase the funding uh, of our economic development program, especially those programs in Family Business Center and Institute for decision making, which are underneath business and community services, uh, the economic development arm of the University of Northern Iowa. So let's talk about each of these a little bit. First of all, when you look at uh, Iowa's workforce demands, what you see in front of you are the 10 jobs career paths that are out there that in the next, from 2018 to 2028, uh, Iowa Workforce Development identified these 10 as the careers, the jobs, the positions that were going to have the most openings that required a baccalaureate degree. As you look through this, I want to call your attention to a few things. Number one, registered nurses is the top. There is a critical shortage for registered nurses in this, in this state throughout the country. After that, uh, what you will see is sort of an alternating pattern of people in education and people in business and especially in management. One of the reasons that so many of the students that graduate from the University of Northern Iowa stay in the state of Iowa is that our curriculum so closely matches the needs of this state for baccalaureate trained and prepared individuals. As you look through this, every single one of those except registered nurses is on our curriculum list and are at some of the, in two of our most well-known uh, and most recognized colleges. Even the coaches and scouts, those are really high school coaches and support staff members um, coming out of our College of Education. So it really, we are extremely well aligned with the workforce needs in the state of Iowa, especially those positions requiring 
uh, a baccalaureate degree. Uh, currently, uh, a little over 80% 80, 80 of our students take their first job in the state of Iowa, and 50% of the students that graduate from UNI but came here from out of state take their first job in the state of Iowa. We're helping solve some of those economic problems that we're facing in regard to, to filling the jobs that are here in the job shortage in the state. I want to look just a little bit at the college market share. This is one of the issues that we're having in the state of Iowa in filling the jobs that I just showed you about. Getting people to the baccalaureate degree is critical to fill those needed jobs. And there are a lot of jobs that are open in this state. Some require a baccalaureate degree, some do not. What this chart shows, and this was actually taken from a presentation that was presented to the board last fall, what this shows is what high school students, the history of what high school students have done over the last several years from 2013 to 2019 in terms of their next step after graduating from high school. I want to draw your attention to the gray bars at the top. You see up there are the students that after completing high school chose not to go on to any form of higher education, any form, whether that's a university education, a community college education, a private education, or even a trade education, a cosmetology school. Many of those are represented in that uh, in the box that is for-profit uh, institutions. What you see is that we've dropped from about 23% of our students not going on to any form of education to 33%. To remind you that it wasn't that long ago that Governor Reynolds called for, through Future Ready Iowa, us to work towards a goal of having 70% of our adults in this state, our workers in this state, to have some credential beyond high school. At that time, we were up around 75, 77 percent of our uh, high school students were going on and getting a credential, at least going into higher education. The lift was to get people who were beyond high school graduates, had been in the workforce, to get back into the workforce. We're at a point now that we don't even have the students coming out of high school going on to any college credit making that 70% goal is going to be extremely difficult if we can't change this trend and get more of our students to go on to some form of, high, some form of education beyond uh, their high school education. Uh, the information that you see there for the Regent schools looks pretty positive. We're, we're really about the only institution that, a set of institutions that hasn't shown a dip. I will, though, point out from 2017 through 2019, we have seen this drop. But notice that the gray bars, it was in 2017, 2018, and 2019. Those decreases were the largest. It was really starting to hit home. And again, this has, is, is directly related to the very hot economy in this state. Uh, the very low unemployment rate pushed wages up for entry-level people. That was good for them. It was good for some of those businesses. But it does mean that we're creating a problem in this state in being able to fill the workforce needs for those jobs that require a four-year degree and in many cases, even a two-year degree or a professional degree of some sort. We've got to find ways to, to tackle that problem. And that's really what all three of these institutional requests are about, is helping address and pull more and more students, to help them realize they need to get into some form of higher education beyond high school. One of our requests is to uh, differentiate our tu tuition, to continue to differentiate our tuition uh, one of the things that I've spoken about before is how different the state of Iowa is when it comes to uh, the tuition rates uh, between the regional comprehensive university in the state, namely the University of Northern Iowa, and the uh, research institutions in the state. If you look at our neighboring states, as I've pointed out here, and you look at what is the tuition rate at uh, the research institution, in particular the flagship institutions in that state, and then compare it to their regional comprehensives in that state, um, what you see is that the average difference between uh, the research institutions and the regional comprehensives is about $3,400. Here in the state of Iowa, we've made some progress in the last four to five years in moving that number from about $200 to $800, but it still puts a, 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 it's very different here in the state of Iowa competitively than for the regional comprehensive, namely the University of Northern Iowa. So we want to continue to differentiate ourselves in tuition and uh, the $4 million uh, that we're asking for for tuition differentiation is to help us keep our tuition as low as possible. 
uh, would really love to keep that flat, if at all possible. But it does depend on having the resources to be able to, to meet the commitments that we have to our students, to provide a high quality education, uh, to be able to have the services that they need to support that education uh, through some of the staff uh, support systems that we have and that you heard about during the awards that were given yesterday. Uh, those are essential. Uh, so the, the resources, the financial resources we have uh, really do correlate directly to the quality of the education that we're able to offer. Um, and so we're, the $4 million that we are asking for to help us differentiate will help us keep our tuition down for all of our students, provide better access for students across the state of Iowa. The other special, the one special request we have for new funding is with the UNI at Iowa Community College Partnership. Um, we started this originally with, the with Des Moines Area Community College and when we started UNI at DMAC. Uh, we expanded it this past year to include three other institutions that on this chart you can see include Western Iowa Tech, Iowa Western Community College, and Indian Hills Community College. Uh, at each of these sites, we're placing a person on site um, to help support students, to provide that level of support that students need, to bring the high touch, personal feel of a UNI education to our online programs and to the students in this part of our state. What we know is that across this state, we've got many students that are place bound. They're typically a little older than the average college student. They're not those high school students we were talking about a little bit ago. They're looking for, that many of them have a two-year degree, and they're looking for a four-year degree so that they can move into some of those jobs that we spoke about as well. But they have no way to access a, re a regent's public university with where they live. The commuting distances are simply too far. It's why we've selected these three institutions in particular to start with, uh, at Western Iowa Tech, Iowa Western, and Indian Hills. They are some that have some of the greatest travel distances, but we have had reasonable luck with some of those students transferring directly to us. They also have curriculum that align well with our curriculum. And so we've reached out to them, and what we have seen already is significant growth in uh, the students that are in our online programs, especially associated with these institutions. This year, when we looked at our transfer student numbers coming in, and now these will include students that come directly to us, as well as students that have gone into our online program through UNI at Iowa Community Colleges, we've seen an 18% increase in transfer student enrollments this year. But when you look at those four institutions where we have UNI presence, they're up 40%. The other institutions are up on average 11%. So transfer students are coming back, but where we've been able to work directly with those communities, we're seeing some real success in getting students one into these programs and helping students that before did not have access to a, to a four-year degree get into that four-year degree. And some other students in those areas realize that transferring to the University of Northern Iowa is a very good thing for them to do. This program, what we have used, the, the funds that the governor gave us last year through um, uh, American Recovery Plan funds. Most of those dollars go to scholarships to help r reduce the barrier of cost to these students. As I said, most of these students are place bound. They're older adults. They have families. They have jobs. They figured out how to finance uh, their education and continue their education at the community college. That there's a barrier though when they decide to come to the University of Northern Iowa or one of the other uh, region institutions, the cost is a little bit higher. And so we're using those funds to pull back some of that tuition so that the cost to them stays approximately the same as it was for them to get that community college education. So we've removed the barrier of location by bringing the education to them. We've removed the barrier of cost by dropping, using these federal funds to be able to drop that cost down to what they're used to paying. And we've removed the barrier of support. Since these are online programs, many students aren't ready for that. They are also very used to having people around them that help them with questions around tutors, or how to talk to a faculty member, or where do I get my financial aid, how do I get registered. We've put somebody in place at those institutions. So the $2 million that we're asking for, some of that is continued scholarship support to remove that barrier um, and make sure as many students can get into this as possible. But then we will also be placing uh, student support specialists at four additional institutions around the state as we grow this program. So that's what the $2 million is, is really for that we're asking for the UNI at Iowa Community College to present. What you can see in this slide is the degrees that we are able to offer to our students at the moment. Again, 
they match well with the, the needs within our state for people who have a four-year degree, as you read through that. Um, some of these are, are new programs that have, didn't exist even a year ago, including the Human Services VA. One of the management degrees in business administration, uh, the VAS, wasn't there. All of these are set up as really two plus two programs. We ask that the students complete a two-year degree at a community college, any Iowa community college, and then they can enter this program and complete a degree with us um, in a two-year time frame. If their schedule will let them do that, um, they're, they've got a lot of other things going on in their life. Um, sometimes they don't schedule it in a two-year period, but they do have the option of being able to do that. We are always looking to grow this list of uh, uh, online programs, and faculty are very interested in helping move this along, but again, focusing first and foremost on those degrees that are most needed within the state of Iowa. We're also asking for $400,000 in new money for economic development, and in particular in the Family Business Center and the Institute for Decision Making. We've seen real growth in the Family Business Center of late, and, and it's a, uh, a center that a lot of people don't know about, but it really supports family businesses across this state and into some surrounding states as well. Um, one of the things that we know is that as family businesses grow, and in particular as they transition, there isn't necessarily anybody there to help them figure out how to handle that transition from one generation to the next. The person who started that business had a creative idea and has grown all of these great ideas into a business that's very workable. The next generation may well have been part of that and worked in those shops, worked in that business, and now, but how do you hand that over to them? How do you make that transition and make it successfully so the business doesn't drop off? New ideas are coming in. One of the things that we know is that that transition from first generation to second generation typically goes pretty smoothly. The transition from second to third is more difficult, and each successive generation is further and further away, largely because they didn't know the founder and the ideals upon which that business was built. And that makes a big difference. And so we work closely through the uh, Family Business Center with family businesses to help them understand that. Not some by the expertise we have, but more by bringing family businesses together and leaders in family businesses to share their ideas, to share what's worked with them, and to have these sort of workshops that help family businesses across this state make the decisions they need to make to keep their family businesses viable and moving forward. The University of Northern Iowa is a regional comprehensive, and we're often, uh, regional comprehensives often serve a service area of about 70 miles around their local campus. I put this slide up here really to show you the impact that UNI has across the state. And similar maps would be shown by the University of Iowa and, and Iowa State as well, how they impact the state. The dots up here represent just five key areas from the work that we do with the Governor's STEM Council and STEM Initiative, um, the business and entrepreneurial um, assistance programs that includes the Family Business Center and the Institute for Decision Making, the things that we do in violence prevention and, and bystander training across the state, uh, and then the environmental and sustainability assistance, and then other economic development. As you can see, for a regional comprehensive, we're in every single county of the state. This represents more than 4,000 interactions with business and communities across the state of Iowa. We do reach into other states as well. Just uh, in the state of Iowa, 78,000 living alumni in the state of Iowa. Uh, so we really do e impact the economy of this state in a very, very large way. With that, thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have for me. Are there any questions for President Nook? I'd, I'd just make a comment that, uh, Mark, I wanted to commend you and you and I and your team on your community college initiative because I think that's an appropriate niche uh, for you and I. There's a, there's a tremendous need in the state. There are place-bound Iowans out there that uh, I, I think uh, you and I will serve. I, I was fortunate enough to attend the open houses at DMAC and Indian Hills, and I think you've gotten a warm reception on those campuses, and I, I, think, uh, I think this is buttonholed for success, I think, on your part. Yeah, thank, thank you. We really have had a very warm reception. The community college 
uh, leadership, the faculty and staff on those community colleges are very excited about the partnership. The community members um, that have come out and expressed their support for what we're doing to help really their business community, right, by putting four-year degrees on site there has been uh, warmly received by them. It's, it's really been gratifying to see the, the way they've reached out to us and supported this effort. So thank you. Any other comments, Regent Worker? Um, I was just wondering if you've been able to expand the Family Business Center using you know, remote meeting technology and what else you're doing to get the word out about that program. Yeah, uh, of course, during the last two years in particular, we've used a lot of virtual meetings and things for that program. Um, it, it, a lot of those meetings happen at different places around the state. They don't have to come to you and I and to Cedar Falls to engage. Um, we can host those at family business sites, right? Um, one of the advantages of doing that is, uh, you know, if, if we host a, 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 a gathering of business, family businesses, say, at Vermeer Corporation, they get a chance to really see what Vermeer is about, how that works, um, you know, and, and so it is really helpful to be able to move these around the state. It also makes it a lot easier for a family business to be able to get to that area if it's held in their region. One of the reasons that this is so important to me personally is that the small community that I grew up in in Northwest Iowa wouldn't exist without one family business, VTI. Uh, it started out as Van Top Incorporated. Um, it's a large employer in our community, and as I look around other small communities in the area that the population has really dwindled, they don't have that anchor business. And that anchor business in these small communities is invariably a small family business that started off by one or two individuals and has grown into a business of a few hundred employees, maybe a few thousand employees. And uh, it really has strengthened rural Iowa, especially as our farm businesses have become operated by fewer and fewer individuals because they've grown in the size that they can operate with the equipment that's available. So it really has stabilized rural Iowa, the, the communities in rural, some communities in rural Iowa. We've, we've got to really work with them and make sure, pay attention to those kinds of family businesses. So, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Th thank you. Uh, before I introduce the next institutional head, I'd like to rep recognize Representative Bob Krasig, who is with us. Uh, could you stand up for everybody? We we really appreciate it when uh, the we have members of the legislature here to be at our meeting. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, the, the next institutional head that we'd like to speak with is uh, Interim Superintendent Cool. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to speak with you about Iowa Educational Service for the Blind and Visually Impaired and Iowa School for the Deaf. Really quite a mouthful there. Um, I wanted to talk about, I mentioned yesterday that we have a new principal, and uh, he is just doing such an excellent job. If you saw him in the job, you would never know that he's new to administration. Uh, Justin's doing a remarkable job. Um, he's a very organized young man, and uh, is just I'm looking forward to his future because I think he'll just do really great things for the school. Um, Iowa School for the Deaf, one of the things that he did do is he has already met with the teachers um, coming into the school year. Prior to the end of last school year, he met with them, uh, talked to other schools for the deaf, and we've introduced a new curriculum this year, K through 8. Uh, and the curriculum is, the teachers are so excited about the curriculum that the high school now is going to move forward with purchasing the same curriculum, and so we'll have the same curriculum then all the way K through uh, graduation. So we're really excited about that. Uh, the teachers are looking forward to working with that, uh, and I think that's really a good thing for us. It will ensure that the program is being utilized accurately. Um, there are two new electives that we're offering at the school. We don't have a science teacher, as I mentioned. We're doing some online science classes. Uh, going to get those up and going. Um, but we have we are offering a class in robotics, so we've moved uh, what we did were able to hire as a math teacher. We didn't need a math teacher, 
but we went ahead and hired this math teacher because she was such an excellent candidate. So we hired her and then we moved one of our current math teachers over to provide classes in robotics, a class in robotics and a class in computer science technology. And so we've added a couple of classes for our students and we're really excited about that. Um, our teacher, um, math teacher that's doing that uh, is pretty self-taught in the area of computers and computer uh, robotics. And so she's really excited about doing that. We uh, recently, last week, hosted the National Technical Institute for the Deaf out of Rochester, New York. They actually have a regional program in Alabama, and that's where all these gentlemen came from. Uh, there was a uh, crew of about six, and one of them was a lady who uh, was a, also a math teacher, um, and they've just recently hired her. So they came in and provided training to teachers on how to do VEX robotics, and uh, I sure hope there's not a question about that. I did look it up online. I talked to those folks. I went to dinner with them. They're, they're all deaf individuals. I went to dinner with them and had a great conversation with all of them. I still don't know what VEX robotics is. So if you're looking for an answer, um, I don't have it. Um, but, but National Technical Institute gets to the campus, and this is one of the things that um, we really pride ourselves on at ISD is taking care of our campus. The support of the Board of Regents and staff from the Board Office allows us to do that. And now they want us to turn into, they want us to host the national um, competition, robotics competition on our campus. They asked us while they were here if they could come back and host because they don't, they don't have these facilities anywhere else that they go. And they were so impressed with our facilities that they also have inquired about us becoming one of the regional sites uh, ongoing for them to come to on a yearly basis. I haven't had a chance to talk to anybody about that, but uh, we're certainly uh, excited about it and looking forward to working with them uh, as we move forward. On the, that's kind of on the deaf side and on, on this one here uh, on the blind side, we uh, will be hosting or we'll be having White Cane Day on October 15th. Uh, there's events being planned all over the state through all the different AEAs. Um, the learners, as, as you have, I've heard this said many times at, at our meetings, you know, we have to intentionally teach deaf and hard of hearing and blind and visually impaired students uh, things that you don't have to intentionally teach others, other learners. Uh, for example, they'll be going to pumpkin patches. Well, if you think about it, go to a pumpkin patch, what do you see? Well, if you can't see, you're not seeing anything, and so you have to intentionally teach them this is a pumpkin, this is what it feels like, this is what the field feels like as you walk through it. And so those kinds of activities are hosted across the state during White Cane Day. Um, they'll be engaging in a lot of different learning and social opportunities. That's just one example. Um, the IES BVI consultants we have consultants on the blind side in the area of math, science, early childhood, multiple disabilities, and those consultants provide support for teachers of the visually impaired and orientation and mobility specialists across the state. And right now they're really working with the math and literacy skills to enhance learners' abilities in those areas. We continue to look for opportunities for our learners to develop. Our learners, speak, I'm speaking of the blind and visually impaired, for our learners to develop living, learning, and working skills. And so, for example, these, sometimes I look at these and, you know, it sounds like they're really simple kinds of educational opportunities, but they really are significant in the lives of blind and visually impaired students. And so, our students get three meals a day at ISD provided for them. Somebody cooks for them, they come to the cafeteria, they eat their three meals, and they never have to learn how to cook and feed themselves. Um, do the shopping and all of those kinds of things, and they have to be intentionally taught how to do those things. You know, walking into a store and being able to see up and down the aisle. If you're walking with mom and dad, you don't see those kinds of things. And many of our learners um, don't get those opportunities with their families, and so we intentionally do that. So this year, um, our regional director asked if we could have the students do their own cooking, their own shopping and everything. So they're going to be doing, they've started already this year, they're doing all of their own um, preparing breakfast. So they leave the, the dorm in the morning, they go over to the four plus classrooms and over there there's a kitchen in, in the four plus area and they prepare all their own meals for both breakfast and lunch. So they no longer go to the cafeteria, 
and they are the four plus students, so they're the ones transitioning out of high school and into the workforce or into post-secondary education. They aren't quite ready for it, and we provide some supports to them, and the community college um, works with us on them taking classes there, so we support that. Um, so those students have their little cohort group in the four plus area that they go over and prepare all these meals and, and work together and learn together. Um, this is a, an exciting thing for us. Um, on the IES BVI side, you can see that we served 677 students this year. Uh, last year we served 654. Um, sometimes it, it might be curious to know what the increase is. Um, it's like, oh, were there more blind children born or, you know, what happened? And really the increase in enrollment, or this isn't really an enrollment, in the services we provide to 670. Some students are moving in from out of state, so families are moving in and we have more students. Um, we, have, we do have a few more referrals across the early access area. And then as students age, their vision may decrease. And so students in fourth grade who might not need services might get to seventh or eighth grade and need services. And so we have an increase in students because of that. On the ISD side, you can see that our enrollment went from 68 to 90. Now, I started at Iowa School for the Deaf in 1990, and our enrollment was 108. And in 1998, when um, Nebraska School for the Deaf closed, 26 of their learners came across the state and started going to school at ISD. And at that time, we had 141 students at ISD, and so we went to 167. And we've steadily seen a decrease in our enrollment, and that's you know, 94142, IDEA, ADA, everything that's happened over the years to keep the learners at home and in their home school districts, uh, the advances in medical technology and those kinds of things that the uh, success that we're seeing with cochlear implants. Cochlear implants are wonderful. They don't always work, but they're wonderful when they do. Um, but so we've, we've just steadily seen a decline in enrollment. Well, this year we're going up 22 students. We, we can physically count noses on the campus at 90 this year, and um, that's an exciting thing. Our elementary program was really dwindling, and this year we've doubled our enrollment in our elementary program. Um, and you might be wondering what is it about, why are those enrollments, are the enrollment going up? And there's, there's a few factors for that, and I won't name them all, but just a couple of them. One of them is that, um, Historically, the community colleges have provided sign language interpreter training programs. So Iowa Western had one, Des Moines Area Community College had one, Kirkwood had one, and Scott County. So there were four interpreter training programs, sign language interpreter training programs in the state. We're down to one. Scott County is the only community college currently offering an interpreter training program. There's other sign language classes being offered, but nothing. Uh, therefore, there's less interpreters turning out. So the school districts across Iowa have a child who's identified as deaf, hard of hearing, has to use sign language, um, is not a successful listening and spoken language child, has cochlear implants, maybe they don't work, has uh, um, some other kind of amplification device it's not working for them in terms of accessing language, or for a variety of reasons, they just really can't participate in their classroom. Uh, so, be but mostly because they can't find sign language interpreters once in a while a teacher of the deaf to provide direct instruction, we're seeing an increase in students being referred to ISD. Um, second reason is that, you know, we've recently started our ISD outreach program, and um, I was just had a meeting with the Department of Education, and I've had two of those meetings already this year, um, and we're working with them, collaborating with them, and their consultant has taken our uh, folks from our outreach program around the state to meet the local districts, to meet in the AEAs, to meet the folks around the state. And because of that collaboration and work with them through the outreach program, people are getting to know our services at ISD. They're getting to know us. I met a, a superintendent from um, one of the school districts uh, on, just off of I-80, about 70 miles from ISD, and he'd been to ISD and he said, I didn't even know this was here. I said, well, how long have you been a superintendent? He said, well, 15 years. And he's just 70 miles down the interstate, and he didn't even know we were there. And so it really is name recognition, and we're working hard on trying to get our name out there so that 
you would think in this day and age that people would know with all the social media you know, or Facebook, those kinds of things, but they just don't know about services. And if you don't have a deaf and hard of hearing child in your school district, you're not likely to know about Iowa School for the Deaf. So we're getting our name out there. And uh, ISD, finally ISD is um, hosting the camps again. And we went without that because of COVID. We didn't have camps on campus. And now we're doing that again. And we always, um, as we started those camps, we started to see that about 30% of our referrals came from those camps. Students with deaf and hard of hearing around the state would come down, they'd participate in the camp, they didn't know the school was there, their parents would see the campus, um, and the next thing you know, we've got a student who wants to be down there with their buddies, and so we get referrals through our camps. We're also taking these camps out across the state so that the student, we can provide services to students right where they're at in their home districts so that they don't have to travel. Um, like me, I'm sure each one of you would say, ah, I've got a fourth grade student, I don't want to send them three, four hours away to go to school. You know, but if we can go out and provide opportunities for them right there in their home districts, um, we find that to be very helpful. On the strategic plan, um, as you know, we, I mentioned last time that I spoke with you all that we have our strategic plan written, we're up and running. Um, just wanted to talk about a couple of the, the goals out of that. Um, you hear a lot about social emotional supports for students um, and it doesn't matter whether it's the expanded core curriculum for either the deaf or the blind um, the social emotional aspect of it is really important and the isolation that occurs for deaf and hard of hearing blind visually impaired just because of their disability is one thing but the added uh, stress that they've had from COVID and, and other things um, we really we're really focusing on that uh, for our students We, at ISD, we have the multi-tiered system of supports in place, um, which is something they're doing around the state, and we, had, uh, we have the AEA helping us to, to accomplish that, and our goal was by the end of this year, that by the end of this school year, that we would have an MTSS team in place, up and running, and uh, we've already accomplished that, so we can move on to the next tactic, so I just wanted to kind of mention that. Um, and then on the blind side, you'll see that we're talking about um, increasing the number of assessments completed in expanded core and we have to get a baseline and so currently we're working on getting a baseline on what the assessment tools how often the assessments are being done and what assessment tools are being used so that we can get a real feel for what those assessment tools are and so they're working real hard on that side I was talking to one of the regional directors about that um, and She's, she would like to be able to say that she knows what the assessments are that they're using after all this time, but you know, you just don't know. Each school district or AEA can do something different. So hopefully we'll know more about that in the future. Uh, we have the Grow Your Own program, which you know, we talk about the shortage of interpreters, or um, excuse me, um, teachers of the deaf and teachers of the visually impaired. And so one of the things that we do with with the support of both um, our appropriation and um, Part B monies through the Department of Education. We use Part B money on the deaf and hard of hearing side and we use appropriation money on the blind and visually impaired side. It's just kind of, that's the way it's kind of operated and I can't necessarily tell you right now why that is. Um, but we provide tuition and fees. Uh, we ask for a minimum of three years of employment from them. Uh, they sign a contract to do that. And um, since 2011, we've had 40 people participate, and of those 40 people, 32 of them are still employed by ISBVI, and we think that's a pretty impressive number. We're not losing them to out of state, so we get to train them, and we get to keep them, I think that's important. On the deaf and hard of hearing side, it's not quite the same. We don't have the same number and, uh, of teachers who participate, and part of that is uh, because while we have a shortage, we're still able to recruit teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing more readily than we can hire teachers of the blind and visually impaired. What we tend to do on the blind and visually impaired side is we'll hire somebody who has a generalist degree like special education because we can't find a TVI and then we bring them in and we train them to be a TVI. And that's where we provide their tuition and fees and support and that works out really well for us. And then finally, the funding request for this next year is a 2.5% increase, just keeping parity with the K-12 educational programs. 
and then uh, $300,000 uh, additional funding for the Lee K Family Support Mentoring Program, which was a part of the Lee K legislation that you guys worked so very hard for us to get passed. So grateful for that. The first time that I worked on K-12 Lee K legislation was in the early 1990s. And so for 30 years, we've worked toward the passage of that legislation and it finally passed. Uh, there's no money attached to it right now. We're asking there's for $300,000 so that we can get that family support going. One of the things that I, I did talk to the Department of Education about is I would be willing to internally move some funds around so that I could hire a family resources coordinator, somebody to engage the families. The Department of Education is doing some research right now and they ask that I hold off on that position. I told them I would. Uh, with one exception, I said, you know, we need that person for our own students and our own families as well. And so if we decide as a, as a school to move forward with hiring that position, I would let them know that we're hiring the position moving forward for our families only. And then if in the future we can make that position available, once they've gathered their information, we can make that position available to help provide services throughout the state. Obviously, one person isn't going to be able to do that. But we've had tremendous success with a gal that we've contracted with. She's a graduate of ISD. She graduated in 93. She's raised five children of her own. She's homeschooled them. She was a teacher at ISD. She was our athletic director. She was quite an athlete when she went to school there. She lives locally, and we've been contracting with her to go in to provide mentoring support and family support uh, in the Council Bluffs area and a little bit of southwest Iowa. And she has had tremendous success with the families. They call and ask for her. They want her back. Um, we're really excited about what she's doing. So um, that kind of concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any uh, questions for Interim President Gruel? Superintendent Gruel? Regent Ledger? Thank you. Um, and we've worked together for years on the, these issues. I'm so excited that you are moving forward now and, and have that position and it's just great. So thank you so much for your stepping in with your leadership in this now. You're welcome and I just, on that note, I just have to say, if it wasn't for you folks, it wouldn't have passed because it was dying again. It was really basically dead and it was the work that Mary Brown and all of you did behind the scenes that caused that to happen. And I've shared that with the deaf community. The deaf community brought together their constituent group. They worked really hard. And, and for the past six or seven years, there was a group that really wanted to do that. And they couldn't get it done. And they just needed support. And then once they got that support, we got that through. So thank you. We're excited about it. Thank you. Oh, uh, Regent Barker, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, Go ahead. So you described some long-term factors that are influencing enrollment uh, in different directions, uh, changes in medical technology versus the decline in the number of interpreters in public schools. Now, your increase this last year was probably due to some short-term factors. I'm just wondering if you look in the long-term, do you think, uh, do you see enrollment increasing, decreasing? I know, I know that's hard to gauge, but what's your sense of that? That's a really good question. Um, I think that, you know, the reason I mentioned that there, was 100, there were 108 students in 1990 is because in 1990 folks thought that we would uh, eventually not be there. So that was 32 years ago. We're still there. Yes, our enrollment declined to 68. Um, we're seeing it go back up, and I think that we're going to go up a little bit more. Um, and I think we'll continue to stay right at that level. Um, birth rates aren't as high as they were, um, or, you know, like we accomplished, uh, we, we no longer have rubella. That's really the big one that people talk about because there, was, there were so many deaf students that came out of that rubella epidemic. Um, so I don't see, and you can't predict, no crystal ball, uh, I see us staying right where we're at pretty much. We'll see a little bit of an increase. I think we'll continue to see a little bit of an increase. Um, there's a, there's, there, there, I've dealt with um, folks who hear that, well, sign language interpreting isn't going to be needed in the future because cochlear implants will eradicate that need. 
And um, I've heard that since I've been in the field and became an interpreter in 1981, and it hasn't changed. Students today are still learning sign language, and so the, the need is still going to be there. I don't know if we're going to get back to where we're going to have more interpreters turning out. Um, it's not a high-paying field, and so I talked with the Department of Education, and I think we're going to continue to need that option on the continuum for a while into the future, and that our numbers really won't increase significantly, but I think they'll slowly, slowly rise a bit more. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? Thank you all very much. Appreciate yeah, it. That, thank you. At this time, I'd like to recognize uh, President Wilson from the University of Iowa. Good morning, President Richards, President Pro Tem Bates, um, members of the board. Happy to be here this morning to give you a brief update. Just going to give you a few updates about what's going on at Iowa and then focus on our portion of the state appropriation request. There's a little handout going around just to give you some more specifics. They're hot off the press data that we didn't get into the slide presentation. So I um, wanted to share some additional data with you. So. Just a couple of comments about our class of 2026. We are really excited about the enrollment numbers that are shared with you on that page. Uh, the class is comes in at 5178 undergraduates, 5,178. And this is our third largest class in the history of the University of Iowa. So in spite of a lot of concerns nationally around enrollments, we're really excited to bring in a very robust class of new students. And uh, it's about 13% higher than last year. So uh, over 600 new students compared to uh, last year. The good news is they're very academically accomplished. Uh, and we're excited that 21% are first in family to go to college. So we continue with the one in five uh, rate of, of students who are first-gen students, which is great. They're coming from uh, 92 of the counties around the state of Iowa, and 54% of them are uh, residents. So uh, in addition to that, we welcomed 1,240 transfer students and 1,249 new graduate and professional students. So the place is hopping. There's a lot of energy on campus, as Abby knows. And uh, we're excited to have all these new students with us. We also opened the Stanley Museum. Many of you were able to join us. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's been a great part addition to our campus. We're, lo we're so excited to have the art come back out of storage and be part of who we are and what we do. Uh, you may not know, but we've had over 6,500 visitors since we opened in late August. So the place is bustling. We've had to actually hire a little extra security for the museum because we have so many people who want to come in and, and visit the different exhibits and, and really learn about the art that we have uh, at the University of Iowa. We're also really excited that we're starting to get a lot of requests for K through 12 students to come and spend an afternoon or even a day at the museum, as well as our own students who I was walking around campus the other Saturday morning and there was a student just sitting on the bench outside the Stanley Museum looking up at the sculpture with her backpack on and she was just having a moment before she went to the library, which is exactly what you hope to see uh, with this museum. Couple of updates on rankings. Of course, you know we don't pander to the rankings. We don't, um, we don't try to affect them directly because they're really complicated indices uh, that are often um, quite uh, slanted, if you will, towards selectivity. But when things look good, we're really excited about it. And, the, and I think the thing we're really, really thrilled about is our ranking in writing across the disciplines. So this is a ranking that's unique, and it's um, 
It's one that's done primarily based on reputation. And last year, as you know, we were in the top 10, so we were very excited about that. Uh, but this year, the rankings came out, and we are number two in the country for writing across the disciplines, tied with Yale. And I, I listed the institutions up there so that you could see that we are the only public in the top 10. And you might think, well, this is just the writer's workshop. But in fact, it's not. This is really writing across the discipline. So reminding many of you, some of you know this, we have a Frank Business Communication Center in Tippy. We have the Maggot Center for undergraduate writing in class. We have the Hansen Center for Communication in the College of Engineering. Those are all uh, po made possible by donors who believe in the power of teaching undergraduates uh, good writing skills. And we even have the Writing and Humanities program in the Carver College of Medicine. So we are really, truly a place where we emphasize the skills related to writing and communication across all disciplines. And um, just to you know, give some context to that, in 2022, LinkedIn did a study uh, of employers and found that communication was the number two skill needed in the workplace, rated by employers across the country. So we know we're doing the right thing, and our students tell us that by the fact that they're coming to our university and they want to learn how to write and communicate better. So really excited. In addition to that, number nine for undergraduate nursing. Last year we were 10, so that's just great to be in the top 10. College of Nursing is doing great things, and of course, uh, applications are up. I'll come back to that when I talk about the state appropriation request. Uh, the one thing I wanted to do is just acknowledge that the overall rankings are, I would say, pretty steady. We, we're in the same spot with private and pu publics combined, 83. We were down two spots when you just look at publics. Uh, and so, you know, those are things for us to think about. What we're most interested in, though, are the metrics that we care about, and they are metrics related to student success. So we did improve on class size and things like our graduation rate for Pell. But as you all know, we are laser focused on retention and graduation rates, not just because of the rankings, but because it's the right thing to do for our students and for their families. Uh, so I wanted to just share this. You've seen this chart before. And the, the point of showing it to you again is to remind you of the, some of the metrics that go in and how important retention rate and graduation rates are. Collectively, those account for about 20% of the rankings. And so we know that we have work to do. Uh, and you can see that our retention rate is below our peers. These are the Board of Regents peer groups that we've identified over the years. But I think the important thing to remember on this is that um, our graduation and re retention rates are really quite strong when you think about the difference in admission rates. So look at UCLA and Michigan, the top two in the publics, and the admissions rate for UCLA, how many applicants do they admit out of all that they get? 11%. So uh, UCLA admits 11% of the student applicants. Michigan admits 20% of the student applicants. Compare that to Iowa, we admit 86 percent of our applicants, uh, and that's through the region standardized ad, ap, uh, admissions uh, formula. So we are doing phenomenal, given the fact that our doors are widely open to students with lots of different backgrounds. And um, you know, the fact that our graduation rates are as high as they are, given the, how many s different kinds of students we're bringing to our to our campus, I think is a is the real unsung story here, and the thing that we should emphasize more and more. And and we're trying to do that. We are a flagship public university with doors wide open for many, many students. OK, let me turn my attention to the state request for F FY24. Uh, as you, I think, know, we are really laser focused on nursing. This is one of the workforce issues. I think uh, President Nook pointed this out already. People are calling on uh, the need for more nursing, not just in Iowa, but across the country. And one of our requests is to increase the nursing workforce in Iowa. And the request is really uh, based on two different funding avenues that will help us. One is to renovate and increase the space we have in our simulation training center. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, but that 
facility, that training center is critical to how we educate nurses, and it's cramped, it's small, and it needs upgrades. Uh, in addition to that, we need more faculty. If we want to train more nurses, we have to have more faculty. This is an accreditation issue and a quality issue. So our two uh, requests, six million and one million collectively, would go toward adding uh, 48 nurses per year, and you can see over the next four years, we would grow the graduating class from 144 students to 208 students, that's per class, 30% increase. So we know we can do that with the right funding and the right support, both on the faculty and the simulation side. Here's a nice picture of our simulation, uh, an example of simulation. If you look closely, that's not a real baby, but it's an example of how realistic good simulation centers are. Ours happens to be 15 years old, needs some upgrades. It's small, needs more space, but you can see that the kind of work we're doing with nurses involves neonatal care, pediatrics, adult surgical. We want our nursing students to get the most realistic uh, opportunities to train, and these simulation centers are a really core part of our ranking and part of our quality. Uh, so that will allow us to increase the upgrade the technology and increase the capacity. And we need to hire more nursing faculty. I just showcased two recent hires that have come to us to augment our tremendous nursing faculty. Uh, the first person, Laura Kendall, is one of our new uh, clinical faculty, and she I, I love that she's focusing on gerontology, palliati palliative care, and nursing burnout, which is a huge issue in the profession. And she both teaches and does a modest amount of research in the college. And then we have Clar Clarissa Shaw, who's a tenured track faculty member who specializes in dementia care and has just received an R01 grant from NIH. Uh, and really, she is an example of how our best tenured track faculty are doing both clinical teaching and research as well as patient care. So these are just two examples. We can do more. The state funding will help us to hire more exceptional faculty. The second part of our funding request focuses on our first gen Hawks program, which I've presented to you before. You all know we're in uh, the second, we just completed the second year of our pilot for the first gen program. It's right now small. Uh, the second, uh, you know, second year, and we want to grow this program, reminding you that this is a program that brings students into a cohort and they receive peer mentoring, they receive coaching, they receive particular versions or um, class sections of courses that we know will prepare them to go to coll college and, and benefit from the expertise and, and knowledge of many of our faculty and staff. And the page that I shared with you is an example of what a first-gen student gets when they come to our campus. Welcome, here's your peer mentor, here's your faculty mentor, here's your, uh, your academic coach. Uh, and that's a real wraparound kind of service that we think is really important. And of course, the data bear that up as I have shown you before, in the pilot data that we've got right now, we can take the first gen students who participate in this program and we can increase their retention rates to about 92%, which is even higher than for our general student body, but significantly higher than the first gen cohort who doesn't participate in the program. So our request is to expand the program from 100 to 250 students and to extend it beyond the first year because we don't want to just give students all of the support and then say, now you're on your own in years two through four. Uh, so the goal is to increase the support throughout the four years, add a little scholarship support, and make sure that we continue to really emphasize that first-gen students belong at the University of Iowa. I might note that even with this increase in state funding, we're still not at the 1,000 of our 5,000 students who are first in family. So we're also going to be talking to donors and a lot of our alums about supporting this program. But having some state support will really help us grow quickly and accelerate what we know is a success program. We're also going to build a relationship with IJAG, which many of you know is a program in our uh, K through 12 that focuses on students, primarily first gen, students from underrepresented groups and start to support their um, vision about going to college, which includes 
simple and complex things like understanding financial aid, filling out the FAFSA, but also thinking about what will college do for you, what, what kinds of workforce issues and areas might you be interested in. And if we can partner, especially in the high schools around the IJAG, we think that will be another tremendous benefit and it will grow the number of students interested in going to college. So um, here's just an example of one of our first gen students to kind of concretize this. She hap Chloe happens to be both in the first gen program and in our Iowa Grow program, so she's getting support as she works on campus. And uh, she comes from Prairie City, Iowa. And many, many of our first gen students are coming from rural parts of the state with nobody in their family who's gone to college. And these support programs are really critical for them. So I think that's the end oops, of my comments, and I'm happy to answer any questions about my uh, presentation, the request for state support, or any of the other issues. Regent Quo. Yeah. Hi. Um, great to see um, about the numbers with the nursing program and that expansion. Um, I was wondering if you knew of that incoming increase of about the 48 students. Is that going to be split evenly with the uh, direct admits and the um, early admits, or is that going to be a different distribution? Don't know that answer to that question, Abby. Um, Kevin? Split. The provost says it will be split. So, yeah. Regent Parker? Um, just two quick things. We, we usually think about trade offs. You know, if we get, we improve in one area, we're going to pay for it somewhere. But you've managed to increase enrollment and have, you say, the best academically prepared class. Uh, that's, uh, that's a great accomplishment, especially in a d difficult environment. So congratulations. Thank uh, you. And the other is that a few years ago, we were concerned about what we saw as a slide in some rankings. And that was one of the reasons why we did the uh, P3 program. And uh, Regent Butker and I have paid close attention to how that money is spent. You seem to be doing a great job in using that money to make a difference. You're saying we've stabilized the rankings and are seeing improvements in several areas. So. Congratulations on that also. Thank you, Regent Burr. It's a constant balancing act, as you have pointed out. So thank you. Uh, Regent Marius Wood. Um, thanks for the presentation. Very good. Uh, the First Gen Off program is really very good, too. It, it's very high touch. So just looking at the sheet, there's at least there's four people per student, it looks like, that, that are required. Are, does it require additional staff, or are these all volunteer? How, how do you scale it to yeah. get to the 5,000 kids? No, that's a really good question. It is a high touch, and Regent Barker's asked me about that, too. Can you scale without scaling the cost? And frankly, staffing is a big part of this. Um, you know, we can't ask our staff to take on more and more students and provide the kind of support that is here, including paying the peer mentors. Um, so that's not explicitly pointed out, but the peer mentors are first-gen students who are juniors and seniors in our uh, undergraduate programs, and they, ha you know, they receive funding to be a peer mentor. So uh, we can scale a little bit, but frankly, these are the programs that are not completely scalable in terms of efficiency. The minute we move to thinking about how many students we can cram into a small number of staff, and you know, then we're going to lose probably the support that is required here. So uh, part of the request is to build staffing. And we've talked to donors and alums about that as well. Uh, people are eager to work and do this, but we can't saddle them with too many students, or they won't be successful, and neither will our students. So, yeah. Any further questions for President Paulson? Thank you. Thank you. At this time, uh, I'd like to recognize President Winterstein from Iowa State University. Good morning, everyone. It's always a pleasure to have the opportunity to visit with you about Iowa State. So here's the beautiful set of photos, two photos about uh, the start of the semester. You heard about Destination Iowa State yesterday with Sarah Merrill's excellent presentation. And then just a photo from the cookout that we had on the Friday before classes. 
it really makes a difference to bring our students together, uh, both first year and those returning, to celebrate, to learn about campus, to learn about each other. So what a wonderful time we had, and Cy especially was very complimentary of the event. So. <laughs> well, our campus has truly come to life uh, with energy and enthusiasm this fall semester, much better than even last year where we saw an increase in that energy. And we have a very strong incoming class. First year enrollment is up 6.3% over last year, and it's up over 13% over two years. So our total first year students are 5,728. Non-resident students are up 13%. International first year enrollment is up 35% over last year. So we're slowly gonna come back, I think, with some of that international enrollment. In addition to our first year students, we have a 2% increase in community college transfer students. This larger number of first year students have led us to reopen Wallace and Linden Halls. That was exciting and fun. It, it's so important to have our students in those residence halls because of the communities that they are a part of there. Well, our new student enrollment is up. One of the biggest factors for the decline in overall enrollment over the last few years is our very large uh, graduating classes. We're graduating students at record numbers, and it's a good problem to have. Uh, our four-year graduation rate has climbed to more than 56%. That's more than 15 points above the national average. Overall, it takes an, uh, takes an average Iowa State student 4.18 years to get their degree. Last spring, we had the fourth largest graduating class at more than 5,000 students. We had so many students that several weeks before commencement, we had to add a third commencement ceremony to accommodate all of our students and their family members. Well, Iowa State provides immense value to our students, to Iowa businesses, to our communities, and state support is essential to continue providing this value through our excellent teaching, research, and extension programs that really benefit all Iowans. But take a look at the chart. You can see that our level of general state appropriations has been flat over the past decade. These are nominal dollars not adjusted for inflation. And you can see that although we've received some increases, we've also suffered cuts, putting us at a net increase of zero since 2014. And when you factor in inflation, it's more like a 25% decrease in funding because of the purchasing power of a dollar that has declined so much. To ensure the high quality of our 99 county campus and the premier science and technology programs that Iowa State is known for, we're asking the state for a $12 million increase for fiscal year 2024. These additional resources will be invested in the topics that you see up on the slide, first generation students, the future ready workforce, rural resiliency and vitality by a focus on mental health and economic development opportunities, rare earth independence, and innovative solutions in digital agriculture, manufacturing, and biosciences. And now I'll go through each one of these items. As part of our $12 million request, $2 million would be invested in ensuring the success of first generation undergraduate students from Iowa. For decades, Iowa State has made this a priority with programs to recruit and support first-generation students in all 99 counties. One example is our Hickson Opportunity Awards, which started in 1995. These are privately funded, four-year, half-tuition scholarships provided to one high school student in every Iowa county every year. The average award totals about $18,000 per student over four years. These students become part of the Hickson Scholars, and they're pictured up here from last year, which provides peer mentorship, academic support, and community building during their time as a student at Iowa State. Last year, we provided $4 million in financial aid across all of our programs that support first-generation students. Additional state resources will be leveraged 
with private support to provide even more first-generation students from Iowa the opportunity to earn an Iowa State degree. Four million dollars will be invested in preparing our students for Iowa's future-ready workforce. More than 59 percent of Iowa State students and that's nearly 17,800 students are pursuing a degree in a STEM field. New resources will allow us to expand high demand programs in areas like artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, computer science, computer engineering, data science, software engineering, and other technology programs. The hallmark of an Iowa State education is the rich combination of hands-on practical learning combined with critical thinking and creativity. And that's why our students are so, it's so easy for them to find a career, a job placement after graduation with more than 95% of them doing so within six months of graduation. One million will be invested in programs to strengthen Iowa's rural resiliency and vitality one of the most urgent issues is mental health. With additional resources, we will relaunch our student counseling internship program to help meet the need for more mental health professionals in Iowa, and we'll expand programs such as Mental Health First Aid, which provides training through Iowa State Extension and Outreach to identify, understand, and respond to signs of mental illness and substance abuse disorders. We'll also invest in community and economic development programs that work in all 99 counties to help rural communities thrive. $3 million will be invested to support America's rare earth independence. Rare earth materials are found in nearly all modern electronics such as computer hard drives and cell phones. They're integral to clean energy and national security but the U.S. is reliant on foreign sources for these materials. New funding will allow Iowa State University, in partnership with the Ames National Laboratory and the Critical Materials Institute, to accelerate research that supports American industry in creating resilient and secure supply chains for materials development and recycling. We believe we can leverage this investment many times over to support research and innovation. In fact, an ISU associate professor of physics just secured a four and a half million dollar federal grant for her research in rare earths. Rebecca Flint, shown up here on the slide, is working to help develop permanent magnets that use fewer rare earth elements. Permanent magnets are vital to energy, transportation, and security. They're used in electric vehicles, wind turbines, phones, refrigerators, and aircrafts. And if you fly as much as I do, you'll want to be sure that the permanent magnets are working well. <laughs> Lastly, we'll invest $2 million to foster innovation in digital agriculture, manufacturing, and the biosciences. They are, these are among the state's most important industries for economic growth and opportunity. Additional resources are needed to support our high-performing faculty and staff who create high-quality programs that support these industries and fuel economic growth and technology transfer. They do this often through the ISU Research Park. While we're asking the state to increase its investment in Iowa State University, we're also committed to doing our part. We're committed to keeping an Iowa State University education affordable through private scholarships and other financial aid to reduce the need for Iowans. Our donors, alumni continue to step up in a big way to support our students. Last year, 7,135 students received a private funded scholarship. That's an increase of nearly 650 students over the prior year. Private dollars for scholarships totaled $22.5 million, an increase of $2 million over the prior year. And this is one way that we're driving down student debt. In the past decade, the number of students who graduate from Iowa State with debt has dropped by 11%. Last year, 43% of our students graduated debt-free. Well, here's a beautiful slide of our students walking away from the Student Innovation Center. 
We hope that they have been there using their creativity to make and create, uh, to do something new. We believe our request for $12 million to increase our general appropriation is a critical uh, investment that is needed for the state, not just for Iowa State University. It will ensure that we can continue to do the good work that we do across our three missions and how we support Iowa as a whole. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our budget request. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for President Winterstein? Well, that's getting off Sorry. easy. Oh, just Regent what, Barker. I, oh, okay, okay. I, I just wanted to say that it's, we've been hearing from students, faculty, and staff about what a great year you're off to and that the level of student engagement is high, people are happy to be back, and it's just been, it's really made this a fun meeting to hear about that and also just that every time I come to Ames and learn about a new program, I'm just blown away by, you know, how great they are. You know, the Rare Earth Independence Program I learned a lot about a while back and the agricultural research, uh, just congratulations on uh, what is starting out to be a great year. Regent Barker, thank you. I, I really appreciate your enthusiasm for, for what is happening on all of the campuses of the Regent Universities. And so um, we're going to have a good year. And I think our students are going to be back in, back in the saddle, so to speak, uh, doing a great job of balancing their academic work and their out-of-classroom uh, experiences. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've heard that from all the presidents, that engagement seems to be on the rise as far as an enthusiasm. So thank you. Thank you, President Richard. Uh, I, I want to point out that there's a change in the schedule here. Uh, item G, the sexual harassment and discrimination is scratched for the agenda because the trouble with the autos along on the way. So. Uh, so we won't have that. And let's have a 10 minute uh, break here so that we can, uh, we're a little bit behind, but we'll be caught up. Ten, let's take 10 minutes.
we're back in, uh, after our break. At this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Brad Berg from the Board of Regents office. Thank you, President Richards and members of the board. Uh, for your consideration today is the operating and other appropriations request for fiscal year 24 as provided on page two of the docket. Uh, the request includes incremental funding for the general university line supporting higher education as outlined by the university presidents, uh, new funding for UNI's Iowa Community College Partnership Program, uh, incremental funding for certain economic development lines at each of the universities, and operational increases for the special schools as presented by Superintendent Cool. With that, I would be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Are there any questions for uh, Mr. Berg? It, it should be noted we've looked a lot at the budget. <laughs> we spent a lot of time looking yeah. at the budget. Uh, so, are there any other uh, uh, any other discussion points? Um, in, recogni yeah. um, in recognition of the concerns related to the need for additional mental health services expressed by our student leaders at the breakfast this morning, I'd like to propose an amendment to this legislative request. And specifically, I move to amend this legislation um, by adding $1 million directed to the board office for allocation to the universities for expanded mental health services. I'll second the motion. Is, is there a second? I'll second. Regent Rouse uh, seconded that motion. Uh, now, is there any further discussion? President, Regent Burke. Yes, I, I'd just like to make a comment that I'm very supportive of that. We've heard from our student leaders in all the universities um, how, how, how mental health issues and concerns have increased the past years. We've also heard from our presidents and our universities and I, I fully support this request. Any other discussion? Uh, we we'll, we have to have a, so we have a motion that's been offered and seconded. Now we have, we have to have a roll call vote on that motion first. So we'll do that. Uh, Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Risewood? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The uh, uh, proposed amendment uh, is carried. And now, uh, we, uh, is there any uh, further discussion about the budget? I'll state the following. Uh, a motion and second are required to approve the amended operating appropriations request for fiscal year 2024 outlined in the docket item and to authorize actions by designated region staff to seek collaboration and partnerships between region institutions and other sectors of state government. Is there a motion? So moved. Regent Barker? Second. Uh, and Regent Butker seconded. Any further discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Uh, Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Ryswick? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Bunker, Bunker, Butker? Yes. Uh, get it out. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Thank you, Brad. At this time, we'll have a, a faculty research, research presentation. Uh, it's from the University of Northern Iowa Provost Jose Herrera. 
will present the presenter. Thank you, President Richards and members of the board. Um, I'd like to, to present Dr. Joshua Seabree, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Northern Iowa. He received his BS in chemistry from the University of Kansas in 2006 and received his PhD in physical chemistry in 2011 from Purdue University. From 2011 to 2000, 2013, Dr. Seabree worked as a postdoctoral fellow at NASA Goddard Space Flight. While at NASA, Dr. Seabree studied the atmospheres of other planets and moons while building strong connections within the NASA community. In 2013, Dr. Seabree began work at UNI where his primary research focus is in the fields of astrobiology and astrochemistry and the characterization of primordial environments. Dr. Seabree has worked with over 100 uh, undergraduate students in undergrad undergraduate research, 17 of which successfully wrote undergraduate research grants and received funding during their time in the lab. In 2022, Dr. Seabree was awarded the Beverly Funk Barnes Educator Excellence Award. Dr. Seabury is currently the PI on UNI's Space Program Award by the uh, Iowa Space Grants Consortium entitled Wind Cave as a Terrestrial Analog for po Possible Exobiological Environments Off Earth. The project, now in its third year, is focused on how Wind Cave can serve as a model system for the icy moons of the solar system and has provided unique research opportunities for over 50 UNI students. In addition to the base project, he has received multiple other grants from the Iowa Space Grant Consortium and NASA. I'd like to present to you Dr. Joshua Seabree. All right, well, thank you for allowing me to come and present to you this morning. Um, I'm very excited to kind of talk about what we do with our uh, base program. It's been several years in the making to get this far, and um, hopefully you'll be excited as we get through this. So um, basically what I've been doing for several years now is astrobiology. The idea is we're trying to understand life or the potential for life outside of our own planet. Um, since I'm not going to be an astronaut, I'm going to find ways to do those studies here on Earth. Mostly anymore, I'm either in the lab or I'm trying to find a hole to crawl into. Um, so kind of who we are, I'll introduce the team first. This is the current cohort of collaborators. Um, we've got professors from all across the university, biology, earth science, a couple folks from chemistry and biology and biochemistry, um, Professor Soames over in communication and media. And we're also very closely working with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in California, Goddard Space Flight Center in the DC area, um, plus the, the National Parks Foundation is also helping us. Um, and those are just the active PIs and co-Is. On top of that, we also have the technology folks here on campus who actively are building things for us, the School of Music who's composing music that you'll get to hear in a few minutes, the University of Northern Iowa Museum, uh, the CHAZ, and the UNI Foundation. So it's, it's been quite the large team of players that we've been pulling together for years. Um, on the flip side, so that's who's running the thing, this is who's helping. Um, this is all of the students so far that we have taken into the cave and done work with. Um, at this point, we have over 50 unique students who's worked with us. Um, if you look closely at the picture, you'll see there's a, a couple of familiar faces that are spread between the pictures, especially in the 2022 missions. So we have students that they get latched onto this project and I work and mentor them for years while they're here. Um, so it, it's been just an absolute ton of fun working with these students and working in the caves of South Dakota and now we're adding caves of Iowa to that list. Um, so why caves? That's the biggest thing. Why am I going down into a hole? Uh, I'm going down into holes because they're the closest thing we can to compare to the icy moons of the outer solar system. You've got Saturn and Jupiter out there way far away. It takes five to 10 years to get a mission out there once it launches. Um, so they're very hard and difficult to study directly. But we think that the, the reservoirs that we're dealing with, so within these icy moons, the big planets get 
together with their gravity and squeeze the ice balls, fracture them into thousands and millions of chunks, but it generates little tidal pools and subsurface lakes inside of these um, moon crusts, more or less. And so the kind of idea here is, well, we can't directly sample those lakes yet. So NASA is sending the Europa Clipper ship in 2024 as the current scheduled launch, and we're helping them prepare a preliminary data set. But the idea is if we can find water that looks like that water on Earth, then we'll know what we're gonna to want to be hunting for and what we're gonna to want to be looking for once we get up to that target. Um, and especially here on Earth, we have the hydrothermal vents, we have the sun, we have geothermal energy, we have lots and lots of energy sources, all of which some form of life has designed a way to take advantage of. So we think that these moons of the outer solar system, they have the right mixture of chemicals, they have carbons, they have amines, they've got ammonia, they've got the water, they've got all the tidal stresses from the planet that they're orbiting nearby, which is keeping them hot and warm and liquid water. So we think they have all of the ingredients that's very similar to what we had on the primordial Earth. Um, and so we think there's a good chance we're gonna find some interesting chemistry out there, but if we wanna really get good data out there, we wanna really prepare the instruments by studying the most close conditions here on Earth with mock missions and sample analogs and such. So right now I'm focusing on two caves. Um, we've got one cave here in Iowa that we've just started our work in, and that's the Coldwater Cave up in Winnishik County. Um, we've been in that cave five times this year. We go every third Saturday of the month. Uh, it's a regular thing. I'm leaving Saturday morning this week to go back out there and hopefully get another six hours down there. Um, and it's small, relatively. It's Iowa's largest cave at 17.2 miles. Um, parts of the cave could swallow this entire room, and we call that a small cave. Um, Wind Cave, on the other hand, this is in Wind Cave National Park, about an hour south of Mount Rushmore. Um, it is 162 miles of passage and constantly growing. On our last trip out there in August, I actually got to help add 350 feet to the cave. Uh, so that was exciting. Um, but the cave is huge, it's diverse, it's, we call it spaghettified. Um, if I put them on the same scale, that is the bird's eye view to the same scale of the two caves. So the entire surface area from the bird's eye point of view of Wind Cave is smaller than Coldwater Cave. So that's how twisted up and gnarly this cave is, and you can get lost very, very, very easily. Um, but it's got 162 miles of very diverse environments in there, diverse crystals, diverse life. It's got organisms down there that have never been seen in the world before. Um, that one of my collaborators out at, um, in Ohio just recently got a patent on getting those microbes to repair damage to fabrics so that you have a self-healing fabric, which is really interesting to think about. So, th so the research that we've been doing out there kind of takes on a, a three-step process. We're doing the water, studying how the water's flowing. That's one of the most important ingredients for life. There's plenty of water in both caves. What's missing or is lacking is the food. Where is the energy coming from, that food stuff? Um, so we're really trying to follow those organic trails. Um, when you think about a prairie surface, you've got the rich prairie foliage on the surface. It dies back every winter. Things decay a little bit. The rain eventually washes that down into the cave. And we have ways that we can follow that through the cavern and actually try to follow these nutrient trails to their end point, which typically ends up being some colony of microbiology, some form of life. And many times this is a unique species. And even in Wind Cave, the different water pools have different types of life because they're separated from each other so they don't get to talk to each other. The final thing that we've added to this group is it's not just a science mission, it's a science story. So that's where our Department of Media here on campus, we bring along the media students from UNI and they film us and they get to produce these little mini BBC style documentaries on the work that we're doing. So to actually get ready for the cave, this is just to give you an idea of what we put our students through and how amazing my students are. Um, 
for a research student, they actually have to train. It's not just you're going to walk into a lab, you're going to learn how to use the instruments. It's you're going to walk into a cave and you're going to belly crawl for 100 feet. Um, so all the students who are interested in joining this group, they, they need to do some sort of physical uh, workout in order to actually be ready for this. We're, my longest mission so far has been 11 hours underground. Um, and on that trip, we do several miles. The top video you can see is a, is a simulator squeeze box that was built here in-house by the technology folks. They did a wonderful job. It's one of the best in the state currently. And that's part of our UNI exhibit that's actually at the UNI Museum that can travel around to different STEM festivals. Um, but that's what gets us mentally prepared. It's like, I can go through a seven and a half inch gap on that box, which is smaller than a water bottle, so that when we hit a nine inch crawl in the cave, oh, that's two and a half inches extra space. I can fit through there just fine, uh, which is what you're seeing down below. It's a place called Hobson's Choice in Wynn Cave. Um, the students have to put on all kinds of fancy gear. Um, helmets, knee pads, elbow pads, gloves, shoes, it all has to be for that cave because we don't want to cross-contaminate caves. So I've actually bought shoes for my students so that they can wear their own hiking shoes just for that cave so that we don't track bad things from one cave to the next cave by accident. Uh, for those students who are working with me in cold water, it's named cold water because it's 36 degree water all year round. And so we're wearing five to 14 millimeters of neoprene on us at all times in that cave. And we're down there for four to six hours. Um, and we're carrying not a small payload. Um, so this is everything you need to survive five hours in a dry cave. Uh, we've got, plus all of our science equipment. So everything on the uh, left side is our science gear. That's our lights, that's our power supplies, that's our spectrometer. Um, that's everything we need to do our science, and that fits into a shoebox size packing. Everything in the middle is what I need to survive in the cave. All my safety gear, I need my water bottle, I need waste disposal bags, a first aid kit since I'm expedition leader, all the calories I'm going to consume during my period underground since there's no fast food down there, and all of that has to fit in that little red bag and I have to carry it all the way through the cave. Um, the cave itself is going to be cool on a hot summer day. The 53 degree air up here is wonderful. On a cold winter day, because we go out there over Christmas break, it also feels good because it's warm compared to four degrees. Uh, if we're in the water, it's 36 degrees. It's wet, low clearance, tight quarters, but also gigantic viewing galleries and absolutely beautiful uh, features down there. This is just kind of a, a look at what some of the students go through. Um, we've got Tess in the bottom two pictures going up and down a feature called the Boxwork Chimney. It's essentially a 12 inch gash that goes down at a mm, 80 degree angle that you have to climb up and down in order to reach some of the deepest lakes at Wind Cave. But then a lot of the cave is more like up in the top corner where we just get to walk around and see all of the different amazing features that are up there. So as far as where we've explored so far, uh, this is where we've been in the last four years around Wind Cave. Um, so we've done, we did a, a little bit in 2019 when we started. That's just the public gallery where they've put in concrete pass, passageways where if you show up, you can buy a ticket and they'll take you on a tour of those areas. Uh, we got our first taste of wild caving in 2020, just as the pandemic hit. And then 2021, we added on going to the lake. We went all the way down subsurface and all the way back up. And then you can see 2022, we've done five trips already this year and it's been an absolute smorgasbord of all of the different locations. Um, that dotted line at the end was the, the 11 hour trip that we completed the first week of August just before school started. And that dotted line that misses and com completely off the map is the new region that we got to map and name. So that was exciting. Cold water, we've gone through the main passageways so far and a little bit up a couple of the side rivers. Um, we've only been down there a couple of times, so we're still kind of getting our feet wet in a literal sense. Um, we're expecting a, a full-scale research 
opportunities to really start diving in in um, October. We've got one more survey mission planned this week. In October, we're going to be hauling in the scientific equipment and such like that. A lot of the issues with cold water is our gear is not waterproof yet, so we're just trying to get everything waterproofed and watertight because we don't want to drop it in six feet of water and when it comes back to the surface, it's completely destroyed. Um, so the in-situ work that we're doing just kind of lets you see and hear from the other team member. Um, we've done a lot of media work with this, so I didn't want this to just be me talking about what my team did. Um, we've created little video snippets so you can hear from the team members across campus and enjoy some of the music. Uh, the hydrology here. gives this uh, pretty unique. It's quite different from the surface water hydrology, you know, especially the water table. The whole idea of water table is different in cave, you know. Um, they go up and down at, at different levels. So we are going to characterize uh, the, the different uh, levels of the cave based on water chemistry and isotopic makeup of water. Basically, trying to make sure you know what kind of connections that we have between the water in the surface, the rainwater, and the deep, uh, the lake water that we have in here. So uh, we're going to do uh, chemical analysis and isotopes to see what kind of mixing is going on. Once I get back to school, I'm going to start doing ion testing next semester, since Dr. Fall has talked me into his field techniques and hydrology lecture. Basic research uh, helps us to uh, increase the knowledge base. That was Dr. Eggball from the hydrology team, just kind of some of what his students do. Um, the rock, the water is percolating through the cave. You kind of saw him climbing on some of the rock features where he's collecting drip by drip by drip. It takes 12 hours to collect a bottle sometimes. Um, but all of that dripping water leads to these absolutely beautiful features in the, in the rock. Um, in Wind Cave, we don't get a lot of the classic stalactites, stalagmites. We get flowstones, which are what we're seeing in these pictures. Under a spotlight, it just looks like ooey gooey rock which it is, but when you f switch over to a black light, they actually glow in the dark and they phosphoresce and it's absolutely stunning. That color indicates that there is trapped organics from the surface that has been sealed in those rocks. And it's sealed in that rock forever until somebody dissolves the rock, which means we can trace the water pathways through the cave whether the water is actively flowing or it hasn't flown for decades. So we can follow where the water flowed through the, the cave by following that luminescent pathway. An astrochemist or astrobiologist, what they do is they're trying to understand what are the ways that life can form, where are the chemicals found that are important for life throughout the solar system and the universe at large. So a cave, which is known to have extreme life down in its deep basement, means that there must be the right molecules for life in the upper chambers. So by following those molecules from top to bottom, we can establish nutrient flow pathways. UV vis measurements on the rock to kind of look at its color. The different colors tell us about the different trace minerals that are present within the calcite layers. So we'll get flowstone and zebra rock measurements in here. All right, so I need one of you on notebook and one of you on pushing buttons. We had seen the frost work before somewhere else, but this was different. I mean, it was much more brilliant and much, it had a lot more color to it too. It was astonishing how much there was and how big it was too. Like it was just a cavern that was, it could fit probably a hundred people and there was enough frost work for everyone to see. So we continued following the water we, we analyze the water, we scoop up the sediment that the water is dripping through, we parse out all the different nutrients that are in there. And we do this across 400 feet of vertical cave. Um, I mean, it takes miles to get through that 400 feet, but we take samples all the way up and down that we can. From there, we go in and we actively sample for the microbes. We have our microbiology team. We've got collectors that are set up all through the cave 
that are catching spores that drift through the cave and looking for unique fungus. Uh, we scrape out bacterial sludges from the bottoms of lakes and pools. Occasionally, a cricket wanders into the wrong spot and becomes a feasting ground for some type of microbacterial life down there. So that is great because we just we don't want it in the cave because it would damage the cave. So we just take the whole thing and and see what grew on it. Um, it's a little gross, but it cleans the cave and it gives keeps my students very engaged with the idea. It's like, well, what insect fell down the shaft this time? <laughs> and then we'll let Slowinski tell his part. I found that there's microbes in the bottom of this uh, cave system. We were really interested in the kinds of species that they had found. So microbes that were once thought to occur only in extreme environments, like the bottoms of oceans or acidic hot springs, turns out occur in regular old soils on a regular temperature and on every continent. They found those microbes at the bottom of this cave too. So there's no carbon, there's no water, they can exist if it's a little living organism instead. The one down at Buffalo Gap, we have a beautiful drip point that actually we filled an entire bottle of water just in a couple of hours. So when I saw that they were at the bottom of this cave, even though it was a small percentage, I was really curious if the same species that lives up in the soil were somehow getting down to the bottom of this cave and those archaea were then populating the water systems or wherever the nutrient sources are in this cave and producing biofilms. And so I thought it would be interesting to see what types of microbes were growing on the sediments, growing on the crystals that form on the lake surface, or were forming on the rocks as the water dripped down and bring nutrients from the uh, surface. So then we bring whatever scrapings and stuff back to the lab. We put them on auger plates made out of different media to try to get things to grow. We then find what their DNA is, run them against the database, and see how unique they are. The organisms in the lake at Wind Cave are 95 unique unidentified genomic material. So it is exceedingly pristine and amazing stuff down there. Um, we're gearing up for a lot of really deep resolution DNA studies here in the near future. Um, but then the last part is we want to get that story out there. We want to engage with the community. Um, and so we've got our little video channel that we've got on YouTube, our Astrobiology Underground, where we release videos every, every year. We release that year's worth of missions of videos in a Wind Cave Wednesday series. Um, and that's all created by students here on campus along with uh, yeah, Professor Sohn and her. He's majoring in both digital media and environmental science. I, I've sort of really gotten to see uh, how each side sort of operates. I've never really done uh, scientific research. You know, I've done, uh, except for stuff in class, so, you know, write, writing research papers, looking through data, I've never actually gotten to do any field research. And so it was really fun getting to sort of uh, use the instruments and tools that uh, uh, we like looked at in class and then you know translate you know a month after we look at it now I, I'm doing it uh, at the bottom of the cave. In the case of both last year and this year students probably discovered things that they weren't planning for and things probably went wrong so I think that experience is invaluable it's not something that can be taught right to think on your feet in the middle of a situation to learn how to get good footage even if everything is working against you. I think those are really excellent training opportunities. And, and so how do you make sure that you cover the information and cover it in a creative way? There's a lot more to filmmaking than you think there is, especially when it comes to documentaries because you just want so much footage, you want so much B-roll to be able to convey exactly what people are mentioning in their interviews and just in uh, quick little snippets. You learn a lot about your own filmmaking skills and what you're capable of when you actually get the chance to do it. So that's definitely the biggest thing I've learned is what actual filmmaking is like independently. So then what are we bringing back from this aside from the, the amazing stories of the cave um, and helping NASA with their work. Uh, for us, for me, the big thing is like, this is a chance to work with my colleagues across campus in ways that normally aren't possible. Uh, it's, I have so many ideas of things I want to see and things I want to do, but I don't have the skill set. Um, so it's a great way for me to reach out across campus and say, hey, can one of you help with this? Um, we'll get you some students and some money to fund them and 
Sure, come caving with us. Uh, so it's a great way to work across campus and get that collaboration built up. But especially for me, I came from Goddard Space Flight Center where I was working for NASA and specifically chose you and I to come and teach at because I wanted to work with the students. I wanted to engage directly. I didn't want to be the professor who sits in their office and just writes grants all day and doesn't actually interact with people. So for me, it was a real big thing to be able to work with the students. I mean, we're out there in a tent above a cave, cooking over a campfire for five days in a row, and we're taking solar showers from black bags we hang from trees to warm up all day. So it's like this is about as down to earth as you can get, and you really build up these cohorts of amazing experiences with the students. And I got one last video from the students I themselves. feel like it's honestly beyond me. It's amazing. Um, I feel like I get to come out here and represent not only myself, but I feel like there's also other women out there who probably don't feel the confidence to think that they could go out there or reach out to a professor and think they could accomplish something like this. But you definitely can. Nothing else on there changed. Sample. Things aren't always so easy for the media team. There's like no room. Yeah. Taking the equipment through the wild cave crawl is definitely going to be interesting, but I'm excited and I'm looking forward to that just because it's going to be a whole new experience that's really unique. It was beautiful. I mean, there's some things I've never, most of the stuff I've done here, never done in my life, you know, or the animals around, the wildlife, all that never seen them in my life, some of them, you know, so it was a different experience and I would gladly come back, ever, like, even on my own. Many of these students have continued to come back, especially when we're, as we're adding these cold water cave adventures, um, they continue to come back to join us to lend their expertise to the next generation of students at UNI. Cold Water Cave isn't restricted just to our research team. It's actually a, a cave that anybody who's part of the Iowa Grotto can go into and explore. So it, it's great having that chance for the alumni to come back and work with the students and help them continue on. Um, so that's kind of where we're at at this point. We've done a lot in the last four years. We have a lot more planned and a lot of exciting adventures. Um, and. With that, I would like to say thank you, and I am open to any questions you may have. I have a comment. I'm glad you're doing the caves instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> Regent. What's Duncan. the rarest thing you've ever run across? Oh, I would say one, one of the features that we've been dealing with is it, it's a calcite structure that is basically looks like a Christmas tree that's grown out of the ground and it's pure white and it's just sharp spiny needles and a perfect cone about 10 inches tall. But then when you put the black lights on it, it phosphoresces a brilliant, like think Disney poison green. So it's actually a Christmas tree and all the bushes around it of the same material that just light up super, super bright green under the black lights. And it's just astonishing when you change from what a caver sees to what a cave scientist gets to see. Regent Rouse. This question is probably more for the South Dakota caves. How, how do you navigate when you're in the caves or how, so you don't get lost? So, so the main routes in the caves have what's called flagging. And it's basically long strip ticker tape. Uh, one end has been cut at a diagonal, the other end has been cut at flat. The diagonal makes an arrow, and that points out. Um, so that gets you along the main routes through the cave. The cave has uh, eight main quadrants it's been broken up into. So you just follow the, those main areas to get where you're going. And then there's tiny little survey markers that look like little post-it notes that then go out in a numerical series on the little side branches and they're super bright reflective. So you hit them with a bright light, you can see them from 100 feet away. So then you just follow the sticker tape all the way to where the cavern hasn't been mapped, and then you start laying your own breadcrumbs out there. Any further questions? Regent Crow. 
Um, so definitely as a student, I feel like really valuable experience for your students. And um, I appreciated that you mentioned the interdisciplinary nature of this um, work. And I was wondering if you see any other disciplines or areas of expertise you'd like to add to this project as it moves forward. Or there's, there's always ideas coming up. Um, one of the big things we're adding with the, with the cold water cave um, we're, we're working on a, a new collaboration with um, the folks who are going to run some of the new Titan missions out from NASA. And they want to get some GIS mapping in there so we can actually use that as a build a NASA rover boat that we will go down that. And so we'll need to bring in some GIS folks probably from uh, geology and geography and try to get some of that added to the mix. It's like these are always there are so many more tools than I can ever come up with that it's like, oh, that sounds good. Who do we have here I can talk to about that? And sometimes it's I talk to the student and they bring along their professor and things like that. So it's, it's amazing the connections that just something that's out from left field can bring about. Absolutely. Any further questions? Thank you for an interesting presentation. You're very welcome. Yeah. Um, here's what I think that we will do. Uh, we will, we're we're going to go into closed session. Uh, and while they're getting it set up, if the board agrees, we'll go get our lunches and bring them back here. And then we will, uh, and then, there, then when we go back into open session, there won't be any further discussion, so uh, just let, letting you know. Now, the board has necessity to meet in closed session for the following reasons. In accordance with Iowa Code sections 21.5.1.A to review and discuss records which are required or authorized by the state or federal law to be kept confidential including the Iowa Code sections 22.7.1 and 11, and the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and B, in accordance with the Iowa Code section 21.5.1.C to discuss strategy with counsel in matters that are presently in litigation or where litigation is imminent and premature disclosure would likely prejudice or disadvantage the position of the board. At the conclusion of the board session, the board will reconvene an open session. Is there a motion that the board enter into closed session? Make a motion. Regent Dunkel. I'll second the motion. Regent Rouse seconds. Any discussion? We have a roll call, Regent Bates. Yes. Regent Crow. Yes. Regent Rouse. Yes. Regent Ricewick. Yes. Regent Dunkel. Yes. Regent Butker. Yes. Regent Lindemeyer. Yes. Regent Barker. Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. 